good evening and welcome. We're going to wait just a few more minutes for everyone to log on and then we'll begin our webinar. All righty. Good evening, and thank you for joining us for the second in our webinar series of Addressing Pediatric Respiratory Issues. Tonight's webinar focuses on obstructive sleep apnea in children. When is snoring a problem? I'm Cassie Pulse, physician liaison with the University of Maryland Children's Hospital. Before I introduce our speaker, I have a few housekeeping items. You may submit your questions at any time during the presentation using the chat box feature. Aaron Rummel, our pediatric marketing manager, will be monitoring the chat box, and Dr. Lasso will answer all of your questions at the end of the presentation. Please note that this seminar will be recorded, and an email with the link to this recording will be sent out next week. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Anna Lasso. Dr. Lasso is an assistant professor of pediatrics for the University of Maryland School of Medicine and division head of pediatric pulmonology, allergy, and sleep. She went to medical school at the University of Panama School of Medicine and did her pediatric residency at Monmouth Medical Center in New Jersey. She went on to complete her pediatric pulmonary fellowship at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Dr. Lasso has been with us at the University of Maryland Children's Hospital since 2006. Dr. Lasso, the floor is yours. Good evening. So um, I will, I'm not sure if you see um, the slides properly. Um, Cassie, can you just make sure that the screen looks good? Before I get started, yes, Aaron. everything looks fine. Yep. Okay. All right. So, what I would like to do tonight is um, give you basically an overview of pediatric sleep apnea, but really trying to focus focus really on a practical approach um, and thinking, you know, kids snore, but when is snoring a problem? Um, so we can come up with hopefully some recommendations on when to refer, when to send patients for a sleep study, um, basically, you know, when to worry about um, the patient. So starting with simple definitions, obstructive sleep apnea is considered a syndrome. Um, the definition is one where a patient has prolonged partial or intermittent complete obstructions of the upper airway. And this obstructions or um, the problem basically causes disruption of normal ventilation and sleep continuity. It is a spectrum of disease that goes from primary snoring that we really don't consider harmful and can be present in up to 13% of preschool and school children um, and goes all the way to what we consider the true presentation of the disease, which is the obstructive sleep apnea um, that causes pathology. And it's present, depending on the literature you review, um, somewhere between one to 5% of preschool children and kind of changes as the kids get to be in the adult group. Peak prevalence is between two to eight years. And this peak really has to do with um, the time when kids have enlarged tonsils and adenoids. When you get to the prepubertal male-female ratio, it's about the same. But by the teenage years, 
the pathology starts to resemble more that um, that pathology that's seen in adults, where it's more common in boys. Risk factors. Um, it's important to think of sleep apnea in all kids, but it's more common, if you will, in kids that have a family history of sleep apnea, in kids that have recurrent wheezing, kids with a history of recurrent sinusitis. Premature babies have a three to, to five um, times the risk of a full-term baby. Babies and kids with poor tone, um, so all syndromes, if you will, that cause hypotonia can cause obstructive sleep apnea. Kids that have upper airway and make maxillofacial anomalies, so children with syndromes that affect the face and the midline in particular are at higher risk for OSA. Um, it appears that African Americans have a higher risk, and obesity I highlighted um, because it is definitely a risk, and it's um, something that we see more and more these days. So it's something to think about um, for sure in patients that have um, gained weight quickly. We think of the consequences of OSA as neurobehavioral, growth-related, and cardiovascular um, sequelae, and it's felt to be related to underdiagnosis or undertreatment, if you will, of the condition. It appears that there is an association with hyperactivity, aggressiveness, distractibility, and learning problems, and this has been shown in multiple studies over the years. Um, a study that was um, published in 1988, which was a while ago, by David Guzal, who is um, an expert in the topic of pediatric um, OSA, showed that in kids in first grade that were not performing well, the incidence of OSA was six to nine fold compared to kids that were doing well. Um, it is such an important uh, cause of neurobehavioral growth um, and problems that we should think of considering the sleep study in kids that are being evaluated for conditions like um, ADHD and other behavioral and attention problems before medications are started. The best predictors for thought problems, phonological processing problems, externalizing problems, aggressive behavior, verbal comprehension problems is are two things. One is the apnea hypopnea index, which is the number of apneas and hypopneas per hour of sleep during the sleep study, and the nadir saturation during that sleep study. So those two factors, or those two signals, if you will, in a sleep study, are the best predictors of the list that I showed below, where um, there is definitely significant um, findings. I apologize because there is a lag time between my advancing the slides and um, Aaron, it's not responding. Um, would you be able to advance the slide there? There. Um, Erin, if you don't mind, I might ask you to advance the slides for me um, because it seems to not be responding very well to my keyboard. Um, sure, no problem. Thank you. So um, the other thing that we, we have to think about is, you know, the concept I think that is interesting and important to think about is that perhaps snoring, um, not by itself, but the association with sleep apnea and school performance issues in the early years um, might actually have a long lasting effect or perhaps what Dr. Guzal in a pediatrics article in 2001 suggested, which is a learning depth where kids that have this problem um, early in life develop neuro neurocognitive morbidity that if not treated properly might actually cause long lasting effects with school performance. Um, he also looked at kids in middle school and did the opposite, looked at what he'd looked at if he, um, patients in first grade, but also looked then at kids in middle school where the, he saw that kids that were not performing well in middle school 
were more likely to have snored as younger kids and have had a tonsillectomy and an adenectomy. So again, showing that perhaps um, there is this long lasting effect of having OSA in early life. Next slide. Cardiovascular consequences are a little bit harder to assess. Um, it's been felt for years that um, OSA causes cardiovascular sequelae, um, but this is driven mostly by adult data. In fact, a recent study um, published by one of our um, doctors, Dr. Peria, Kevin Peria from the University of Maryland and Dr. Amal Isaiah from the University of Maryland showed that pre-operatively, right before a TNA, when patients had an echocardiogram, it didn't actually show, even in kids that had severe OSA, significant abnormalities. So the concern that we have had um, does not appear to materialize, at least not in the pre-op echocardiograms. Um, and so it's something that we consider not doing, which we were doing pretty consistently before um, in our institution. Um, there is also another study that looked at the prevalence of pulmonary hypertension in pediatric OSA and also found um, low in and low incidence. Um, so again, it's a concern that we have had that untreated or undertreated OSA causes cardiovascular sequelae, but in pediatrics, um, which would actually be a good good thing that it doesn't seem to materialize early in life. So perhaps it's not something that occurs quickly, but perhaps over a long time. And, and that is why we see it more in adults. Um, so this is something to think about. You know, we don't see it. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't worry that in the long term it'll cause problems. Erin, next slide, please. So Piece of information that's a really important point um, that I like to always um, remind people of is that your exam awake doesn't predict airway obstruction with sleep. So, um, and the, on the right hand side here, you can see that, you know, patient awake will have perhaps good tone and have good airflow into the airway, but that same patient that awake might maintain a patent airway, might block their airway when they lose their tone secondary to sleep. Um, so to remember that what you see in the office during your visit might not truly help you understand if the patient has OSA and how severe it is. The other thing that also doesn't correlate is the size of the tonsils and adenoids. So a patient might have large tonsils and very minimal, if any, OSA, and the opposite is true. You might have a patient who has very small tonsils with significant OSA. So that's something to um, remember. Next slide. Another thing that's um, interesting is that in the past, we have talked a little bit about scores where you could um, try to figure out if a patient that was snoring had OSA and how severe it was. And there's been studies looking at, you know, a few um, questions, if you will, that could help with this. In fact, those um, scores tend to misclassify patients at least a quarter of the time. And here you have a list of the things that typically used to be asked um, that do not seem to be very helpful. Uh, so is the patient having daytime um, mouth breathing, you know, is that helpful? Doesn't seem to be the p-values are not um, significantly affected. Observed apnea, parent shaking the child to try to wake them because they look scary. Uh, child struggling to breathe, parent afraid of the apnea that they observe. None of those things um, seems to be good enough, if you will, to um, give you significant data. So um, they're not something we recommend. We ask them on physical during our Asian piece, but they're not by themselves enough to give us um, the data that we require without a sleep study. Um, so as a statement, if you will, 
it, it's basically said at this point that the clinical history and physical examination are not reliable for diagnosing OSAs um, by themselves. Next slide. So there's practice guidelines that have tried to help um, pediatricians and um, providers on how to think of sleep apnea and you know who to treat. Um, the first one was in 2002 and the second one in 2012. Both um, were published by pediatrics, the Pediatric Journal. Um, the one, the first one is, I think, very clear to all of us that we should be screening all children and adolescents for snoring, that complex high-risk patients, like the ones that I mentioned before, that have midline um, abnormalities, low tone, Down syndrome, preemies, any of those kids, if there is a concern for OSA, should be referred to a specialist. That the history, if you will, is not good enough in, in really differentiating primary snoring from sleep apnea. So polysomnography is um, what is recommended. That's what it's meant by diagnostic evaluation. Um, but that if that's not available, a referral to a specialist for more extensive evaluation may be considered. Um, that a TNA or adenotonsillectomy is a treatment of choice for children with adenotonsillar hypertrophy. That high-risk patients should be monitored after surgery in the hospital, um, and that includes kids under the age of three or kids that have severe sleep apnea as reported by the sleep study. So more than more equal or more than 10 obstructions per hour or an oxygen saturation need year of less than 80% or both. Um, patients should be followed. So we should be thinking of checking on our patients after surgery and reordering a sleep study. If there is, if the patient was severe at baseline or if there is significant um, symptomatology after surgery. CPAP is recommended if the TNA is not performed or if the symptoms persist after surgery and weight loss should be recommended for all kids and adolescents who are overweight or obese. Next slide. So diagnosis, basically the, what we think or how we call it is an obstructive apnea is a complete cessation of airflow with respiratory effort. An obstructive hypopnea is when there is a partial obstruction and a central apnea, as you well know, is no respiratory effort, so no central signal to breathe, if you will. Next slide. So another way to think of it is um, the way that ENT, if you will, um, thinks of it. And I think that that's useful um, in primary care um, because you might not really have the opportunity to do a sleep study in all of your patients that have um, snoring. And so I think it is important to think of if you have a child with tonsillar hypertrophy, what do the guidelines say? And this is a guideline by um, ENT in 2019 that tells us that if a patient has tonsillar hypertrophy, clinicians should be asking about comorbid conditions that might improve after tonsillectomy. So they, they would like to know if the patient has had growth retardation, if they have poor uh, school performance, if they have enuresis, if they're asthmatics, if they're presenting with behavioral problems. Um, they will, in that guideline, they're recommending a sleep study for kids with um, tonsillar hypertrophy if they're very young, less than two years of age. Um, the other guideline talks about less than three. Um, if they're obese, if they have Down syndrome, if they have craniofacial abnormalities, neuromuscular disorders, sickle cell disease, and polypsychiatrosis. And that is because that list of kids is much more likely to have severe disease that they would like to know about before surgery. Um, so ENT 
is recommending not to do surgery on kids without a sleep study in, in that age group um, because of the risk of having severe OSA um, without knowing about it. Um, next slide. So sleep studies in children are commonly done. They're not fun, if you will, but kids tolerate them pretty well. And um, pediatric sleep, sleep labs are well equipped to deal with kids. Um, kids, the technicians are typically well trained in treatment or how to deal with younger kids. And um, it is all about the environment. So one thing that I will say is that when ordering a sleep study, it is important to consider where you're ordering your study to make sure that the facility that you use has experience with kids. Because it's not the same to do um, a sleep study in a, in a facility that deals with mostly adults. Um, because one is the, the night in the lab that is different, you know, the experience that the technician feels comfortable with kids, that the parents feel comfortable there in how their kids are handled, but also who's reading your study. You know, do they have experience with pediatric sleep studies and are they reading according to guidelines for pediatrics? Um, the guidelines tend to call, um, if you will, peds all kids below the age of 13 and 13 and above gets read as an adult. Um, so for older teenagers, it's, I think, safer to send them to an adult lab. I think for younger kids, it's really important to think of a pediatric lab. Next slide. So I'm give you a couple of cases here just to highlight what we're talking about. This is a five-year-old with history of snoring, respiratory pauses, history of chronic nasal congestion, morning headaches, difficult to arouse, has been underweight, and is referred for a PSG. So here, just to show you, um, you know, this kid had a apnea hypopnea index that to remind you is again, a, the index of the number of apneas and hypopneas per hour. So 35 obstructions per hour um, with a nadir in the oxygen saturation to 72 and saturation under 90% of for 20. 27 minutes. So this is a kid who's having an obstruction very, very frequently, you know, more than every two minutes they're having an obstruction. So the quality of sleep for this patient is very poor. And as you can see, this kids um, frequently in that age group don't grow well because um, they're really having um, significant work of breathing, if you will, every night. Um, next slide. And I'll show you, um, I believe my next slide has just uh, might be a little bit hard to to see but basically the idea is this is the epoch that you would get from a sleep study where you're tracking pulse oximetry at top you you track um the movement basically chest movement abdominal movement and then you get flow so you can see if there is nasal flow or not and then an entitled co2 level so when you have a pause um, like over here, you see a pause, and this is about a 20-second pause. You can see, you know, this this is pro probably a little bit small for you, but basically when when there is a pause in the lab, the uh, reading you get will tell you, one, if it's central or not. And if it is in central, you'll know if it's a complete obstruction or a partial obstruction called a hypopnea. And then what happens with that, you know, is the entitled CO2 increasing during the pause? Are you having desaturations during the pause? Um, and how long is the, the period, if you will, that, that there is a problem? It also gives you heart rate, so you'll also see sometimes bradycardia in response to the pause. So there is patients uh, like this one that we talk about, a five-year-old with 35 obstructions per hour, they're having 35 obstructions every hour of their sleep with naps, with nighttime sleep. So obviously those kids don't grow well, they do poorly, they basically don't sleep. Um, so they have a lot of um, behavioral problems um, that tend to show, um, like I said, with learning issues and also hyperactivity. Um, 
One thing to remember is that in adult medicine, sleep apnea tends to cause fatigue and sleepiness. In younger kids, we see the opposite. We tend to see hyperactivity. Um, so they're usually kind of wired up. They're, they're not really, they don't look fatigued. They just don't stop. Um, next slide. So here, 10 year old girl, um, she's referred to us after having a TNA and actually had a pretty large surgery, a Google of plastic, which is basically a surgery where the um, soft palate and the uvula is removed. And so pretty aggressive surgery with the idea of opening up the upper airway. Um, she clearly failed that surgery, still falling asleep at school, had an Reese's, and she gets a BSG. And this one is a little bit easier, I think, for you guys to see. Um, she has multiple pauses. Um, you know, here there's a pause, a little bit of breathing, another pause. So she kept doing that. Um, she had frequent obstructions, oxygen and saturations, and entitled CO2s um, in the mid 50s. So significant hypoxia with her events. She was treated with um, positive airway pressure, did well with resolution of symptoms. In this case, surgery definitely wasn't enough and she required um, CPAP basically. Next slide. So just to touch a little bit more on the interpretation. So if you get a report from a sleep lab, you're gonna get basically um, a number, what we use the most is the apnea hypopnea index, which is normal. Um, it's considered one to 1.5 per hour. Um, some labs will give you the just the obstructive apnea index that doesn't include hypopneas. Um, and then there is the respiratory disturbance index that can that will add apneas, hypopneas, and arousals. Um, like I said, we typically use and Hopkins does the same, um, the apnea hypopnea index, which is really counting the number of apneas and hypopneas. Um, they'll also give you a saturation nadir, an oxygen saturation nadir. They'll also give you the amount of time that the patient is um, spending under 90%. They'll give you the number of arousals. And when you're checking your results, you need to make sure that the patient had REM sampled um, and that the patients that, um, slept at least 80% of the night to make sure that it was a good quality sleep study. Next slide. So the same in a table form, um, and you guys will receive this in the um, link later on, but basically um, this is a simple table to just show that normal um, on the left, mild would be 1.5 to 5 obstructions per hour, saturation somewhere in the high 90, in high 80s, I'm sorry, and entitled CO2s in the mid 50s. Moderate OSA, 6 to 10, a little bit lower SATs, and higher entitled CO2, and severe OSA is um, more than 10 obstructions per hour, less than 75, equal or less than 75 in the saturation index and the um, entitled CO2 above 65. What we tell people is that, say that you have, for example, six to 10 obstructions per hour, but your CO2 is over 65, I would place that patient in the severe category, even though by the number of obstructions you're not having, you're not meeting criteria to be in the severe category, the fact that you have significant difficulties with gas exchange makes you a more severe patient. So basically, you place the patient in the worst category uh, of your count. Next, next slide. Do remember that a TNA is the treatment of choice in pediatrics, but that there is um, a risk, you know, that has to do with with surgery. So it is important that patients that have severe OSA be treated with CPAP or BiPAP around surgery that anesthesia is involved. So for patients with severe OSA, it is important to uh, make sure that they are known by anesthesia as having severe OSA. 
uh, prior to surgery, um, tracheostomy and oval platoplasty, as I said, are very rare procedures for SA. Um, I have seen them done. We are always trying to avoid them. Um, and in fact, those days we have a much more, um, we have a larger um, group of options, if you will, for pap therapy. Um, so we really, in the last five years, have not sent anybody for a tracheostomy for OSA. Next slide. Systemic steroids in OSA, not recommended. So years ago, there was an open label um, study looking at five days of prednisone in a few children with OSA, no improvement in sleep measures. Um, the risk of taking oral steroids, as you know, is significant, so definitely not recommended. Um, just wanted to make a point to say that. Next slide. Much more commonly used these days, intranasal steroids. Um, however, I wanted to make a point to, to say that there is a recent uh, Cochrane database review of 2020 that says that there is really insufficient evidence to be um, you know, for the efficacy of intranasal steroids. So not something I would recommend at this point. It's something that we used to do, but at this point, um, I don't think it make a lot, makes a lot of sense to go for it. And I would not waste time treating patients with intranasal steroids. Um, if they have clear OSA, I would just send them for therapy. Um, that's helpful. Um, so next slide. So Spending a little bit of time on the complications after a TNA. Um, in a study of 44 children, um, that was done a while ago in the 90s, but it is important to realize that in that study, 32% um, 30, of a third of the kids had complications and significant complications in 16% of the patients. So to remember that even though TNA is the treatment of choice, it's not risk free. Um, so patients that have um, red flags, if you will, young age, thin body habit is severe OSA with low CO2, uh, low oxygen and high CO2, or syndromic features like we talked about, Down syndrome patients. Anybody who is raising the flag as having a severe case of OSA should be done in a pediatric hospital where there is pediatric anesthesia and stay in the hospital overnight after surgery. Next slide. Another study basically showing the same thing. Um, in this case, 23% of patients uh, had severe respiratory compromise after a TNA. Um, and some of them had shown um, during the procedure having significant desaturation and hypercapnia and or hypercapnia requiring intervention. So again, this is another study, the same idea, craniofacial abnormalities, young age, severe OSA. So to remember that if a patient has this factors that they should never be done in a community um, facility where they won't have the ability to be in a pediatric ICU um, if there is a problem. Next slide. So current guidelines are pretty clear on recommending inpatient monitoring of high-risk groups. Um, so just to remember that. Um, next slide. Now, if TNA, if the TNA fails or if the patient is not a candidate for a TNA because they do not have large tonsils and adenoids or because the family refuses surgery. Um, I actually recently had a case of that. Um, we then should consider continuous positive airway pressure or CPAP. It is well tolerated and safe in infants and children. It's frequently used. Um, it is more common to need it in children with congenital facial abnormalities. Um, it studies showed that CPAP therapy um, for about 15 months, minus plus minus three months, with a pressure of 7.9 centimeters of water, eliminated the signs of OSA in 
90% of the children studied. So very effective therapy when used properly. Um, another study to show that, you know, res the respiratory disturbance index um, decreased from 27 plus minus 20 to two um, in kids treated with CPAP. So some patients improving symptoms, the findings on the sleep study also improved. Um, and to remember that compliance with CPAP is actually better in children than adults. So it, it's a therapy that's used. Um, it's not first line, but it's definitely second line and, and an option. I would definitely consider referring um, to specialty care if patients fail um, TNAs because the management of their CPAP tends to be um, by specialty teams. Next slide. So when or why do we order a polysomnogram? So I would think of it if we have to confirm OSA if clinically suspected, uh, particularly in high risk groups. So if you have a patient who has enlarged tonsils, clinical history, if you will, for OSA and is not in one of the high risk groups, um, I think you could go directly to surgery. Um, it, this is a little bit controversial because the guidelines aren't very clear um, and not everybody has the option of a pediatric sleep study. It's not available everywhere or at least not closely close by. So I would not worry too, too much about kids that are healthy otherwise. I would definitely think of a sleep study if there is concerns for very severe disease or if the patients are in a, in a high risk group, like we said young kids, kids with syndromic um, features, kids that are um, morbidly obese, have low tone. Um, in those patients, we do it because we want to know the severity. Because um, like we said, the management won't be the same by the pediatric anesthesia team if the patient has moderate OSA or if they have severe OSA. It's also um, an option for us to test the efficacy of a surgical intervention. So in patients where there's been a TNA, um, it can be considered if there is still symptomatology um, or if the patients were extremely severe to start with and we want to make sure there has been significant improvement. Um, and then TSGs are also used for titration of non-invasive supports, so CPAP and BiPAP. Next slide. We consider referral for a specialty appointment if your patient has mother to severe OSA, particularly if they have comorbid conditions. Obese children, kids with craniofacial anomalies, very young children, or if patients are not candidates for surgical intervention. Next slide. Quickly touching on parasomnias, I think you guys know more about it than I do, but I just wanted to make a point that um, it's been shown that a lot of kids with parasomnias have OSA. In fact, the study done a while ago, um, published in Pediatrics in 2003, showed that 61% of kids with parasomnia had a diagnosis of an additional sleep disorder. And more than 50% of those kids their disorder, their additional sleep disorder was OSA. To think about this, so if you have a kid who has night terrors, sleepwalking, disorders of arousal, um, they can be normal. It can be normal. Like we, you know, it's it's something that may be triggered by fatigue or illness and still be considered normal. But to remember that if it's an, an unusual case that there is an association with OSA. And so to think about it, um, those, those patients might need a sleep study to, to check on that. Next slide. So I think we're close uh, to the end of the lecture, but I just wanted to tell you that um, the topic is pretty controversial. Um, so not everything is written in stone in pediatric sleep. Um, there's some confusing data and there'll be more, more um, to come in the future about this. Um, a recent study showed that 
Um, if you had a sleep study to start in six, um, seven months later, um, about almost half the kids had actually normalized um, without therapy. Um, so that's quite a large number. You know, about half the kids just got better on their own. Um, and so it is important to think as a pediatrician that this does happen, that about half the kids just improves. Um, so I think it's safe if a kid is pretty healthy and doesn't have a lot of other problems um, that you give them some time before you commit to a PSG and therapy. Um, and so I think it's safe to, to um, think about this, but not act on it right away if there isn't um, significant concerns otherwise. Um, the other thing that is difficult is that there's study, a recent study actually, showing that the treatment, so the improvement that we see in symptoms um, in patients treated with the TNA is not always measurable in a sleep study. So it isn't always very clear. So you might get a, a history that the parents give you that major improvement in clinical symptomatology, but when you look at a sleep study before and after, you don't always see that much of a difference. So again, sleep studies are not perfect. Um, they're works in progress, I would say. Um, for some patients, they're very clear. For some, they're not. And so um, more to come on that, if you will. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to say, because um, it hasn't been used as standard of care, but it might become more common in the next few years, is that there is a pretty clear um, picture, if you will, that an abnormal pulse oximetry highly predicts the indication for a TNA. So we could potentially be using home pulse oximetry to predict the need for surgery instead of sending patients for a sleep study. Um, this is something that isn't fully clear and written in stone. It's definitely something that has been shown recently. Um, I think there's gonna be more to come on that because clearly uh, pulse oximetry at home is a lot cheaper than a sleep study. Um, so there'll be, I think over the next few years, more people looking at this more seriously, particularly for areas where there isn't quick access to um, a pediatric sleep lab. Next slide. So to conclude, um, OSA is common in children and adults. Peak prevalence for OSA in childhood is early. It is typically associated with enlargement of the tonsils and adenoids. Um, there is, we think, long-term neurocognitive consequences if OSA is undiagnosed and untreated. Uh, the most common therapy uh, considered effective is a tonsillectomy and a adenectomy. The procedure isn't risk-free. There is prioritative risk of um, surgery. Uh, remembering that watchful waiting is an option, particularly for your patients that are not uh, at high risk or that have no other comorbidity. And that homoximetry might actually become a tool to diagnose OSA in the near future, in particular for children with tonsillar hypertrophy, and in the context where PSG is not readily available. It might actually be, might become um, standard of care, um, but it's definitely more, more likely to become standard of care quickly, if you will, in areas where PSGs are difficult to obtain for pediatric patients. And I think that's all I have to um, for review. So if anybody has a question. All right, thank you, Dr. Lasso. Again, as a reminder, please feel free to type your questions into the chat box and Aaron will read the questions for Dr. Lasso. Okay, great. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to submit them now. Okay, great. Um, what degree of OSA requires a TX? What degree of OSA requires? Um, 
Uh, Lee Naughton has asked, uh, what degree of OSA requires um, a, um, a TX? Therapy, probably. What degree of OSA? I think that that's what we're trying to say, right? Um, so it is a good question and a controversial question to answer. Um, I think we all agree that severe OSA needs treatment. So 10 obstructions per hour or more, we should be thinking of treatment. Um, mild OSA, most people at this point would recommend waiting, watchful waiting and not going for therapy because like I highlighted, things aren't that clear. I think the gray zone is in the moderate um, group that has five to 10 obstructions per hour, or six to 10 obstructions per hour. Um, so my suggestion or the way I think of it is if the patient is having moderate OSA, so five to 10 obstructions per hour, but they're also dropping their oxygen saturation, they're also potentially um, retaining CO2 and have symptoms, I would treat. If they're not having a lot of symptoms um, and their gas exchange is pretty normal, I would wait. I would give them at least seven months to see if things settle down. Um, a lot of this isn't set in stone, unfortunately, because a lot of those things over the years have changed. And I think over the last five years, there's a lot of data saying that, you know, we don't know for sure what to do with some of those kids. Um, so that's the kind of population where I would close, follow closely with families and make sure that symptomatology isn't getting worse and potentially consider a repeat slave study over time. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lasso. Are there any other questions? All right, um, that is all that we have today. All righty, so this will conclude our webinar. Thank you for joining us this evening, and we hope that you found the webinar series informative. Thank you again for attending, and have a great rest of your evening. Take care. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you.